I think it comes down to you, you have the right person with the right information in front of the right prospect at the right time. And companies lose sight of that, you know, and they'll have one size fits all for their content. And, um, you know, they, 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 they don't really talk to different customer segments differently. Welcome to the B2B Digital Marketer Podcast, a podcast helping you to end your struggle with digital marketing, helping you to pave a new and better path to target and capture your ideal customer. Each week, we teach you how insiders and experts debunk the dreary and become engines of innovation. Now, here's your host, Jim Rembach. Okay, B2B DM gang, this is to me is probably going to be one of the those types of episodes that I think you need to really listen to very deeply and maybe multiple times uh, and really th- think about the landscape that exists out there in the B2B world uh, in regards to how we go about attracting and then nurturing leads, because we're going to be talking about prospect experience, because prospect experience can be the hack that attracts and converts more customers for you. And Why? because there's not a lot of people focused in on it. And we have Dan McKay, McDade uh, on the show today to help us with it. Dan, welcome. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate you having, on me, having me on today. Dan, and, and that's actually how I found you, was when I started doing some searching in regards to prospect experience because of my background you know, in customer experience and employee experience. I'm like, when I look at all the things that we do as B2B digital marketers and sellers, it's like, we're not really focused in on prospect experience. And I think that's one reason that's, you know, we're having such difficulty in regards to, you know, connections and conversions and, you know, sales pipeline consistency and all of those types of things. But before we get into that discussion, if you could share with the B2B DM game, just a little bit about your background and experience. Sure. I came out of about 10 years in retail, which was a uh, formative <laughs> Um, I, then I went to 10, 10 years in direct mail marketing. As a matter of fact, I ran probably one of the most sophisticated um, customer acquisition companies in the country out in Medford, Oregon, Bear Creek Corporation, which was Harry and David and Jackson and Perkins and another other n- number of other companies. And we had the most sophisticated um, data systems that you can imagine. And this was, you know, what is it, 50 years ago? So it's it's been a long time. Um, and then I ended up... Um, kicking and screaming. I used to tell people there used to be this publication, and I'll date myself, it was called the First Friday Report. And um, it was all about all sorts of direct marketing, but typically we'd have at least one or two articles about telemarketing. And I thought, you know, I'm not even going to read them. I just never want to be involved in that at all. Well, the early 90s, I got involved with the company as a consultant when I became their general manager. It was basically a business-to-business telemarketing company. And based, you know, the rest of what's happened in my career it really comes out of that experience. Well, and I appreciate you sharing that. And because for me, when we start talking about, you know, how we're going about, you know, trying to generate leads, and we're going to talk, we're going to define those a little bit more in your terms and your experience. When, when you talk, when you talk about what you were doing, and I remember Harry and David, they crushed it for many, many yeah. years. Yeah. Uh, and, it was one of those situations where th- their growth year over year just kept continuing to climb because uh, and climb because of the things that they were doing from the overall experience, prospect experience, you know, customer experience. I mean, it, it, I mean, it was just one of those things that it was a model for a lot of companies to follow. Yeah, um, they had the highest quality product of any company that I knew at the time. It was just amazing. Uh, but it, but it's those fundamental things that they were executing upon that was really the differentiating factor that when we look at it today, it's like, hmm, a lot of companies just lo- have have lost that. Yeah, yeah. They don't know how to apply it. They don't know how to rethink. And there's a lot of things that are influencing that. Uh, but be, and, and, and again, we're going to get into this discussion a little better. And I think it's important to get your perspective on some of the things that, you know, we often struggle with. Like, for example... From your perspective, and, and think about B2B high ticket, what is a lead? And that's a very complicated question, unfortunately, because, you know, if you ask, say, five marketers and five salespeople in the company, you're going to get 10 different answers. Um, but, you know, the, the lead 
I always talk about uh, the definition of a lead isn't BANT or any of these other acronyms. The definition of a lead is you've got pain, priority, process, and environment. So there's a pain or a need. There's a priority to do something about that pain or need. There's a process to go about to do that, which where you, which is where you get time frame and budget. And then finally, is the environment suitable for us to sell our solution to them? Is it a good fit? And so to me, a lead always has those components simplistically. Well, okay. So let's look at the flip side of that. What is not a lead? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I always talk about, you know, the problem with prospect experience right now. And, you know, simplistically in my mind is, is that, you know, companies are attacked by pushy appointment setters or they're having a low level junior telemarketer reading a script that's kind of useless uh, or they're barraged with emails or a combination of all three. And a lot of times, you know, they consider a lead to be, if somebody will agree to talk to you, that's a lead. And, um, you know, that obviously doesn't work. And, and that's where you end up with that dissatisfaction at the end of the process where the sales rep finally has a lead to call. They call them and they say, hey, I wasn't interested in talking to you. I just said yes to get them off the phone. You know, that's not a lead. Okay. So if if I start looking at what is the most prevalent thing in today's world, where a lot of investment is going into it's all around really automating some of the things that you're talking about and even scaling it to a significantly higher degree. And when you put that in perspective, you start looking at the prospect experience and say, huh, you know, we thought it was bad. Guess what? It's getting ready to get, you know, 50x worse. And so I'd love to get your perspective on, you know, what, where are we headed and where is the opportunity to truly stand out? Yeah, I think, you know, the biggest problem in my mind, and it's interesting because I've been working on a couple of different blogs on this topic over the last week or so, but I think the biggest thing in my mind is, is that companies don't have a good sense for how much a lead should cost. I read a, a headline in an article today and it said, did you know that the average lead cost $183.70? And I've seen as low as $15 and I've seen as high as maybe several hundred dollars. In reality, you know, for the kind of business that you and I have been talking about, sort of uh, high-end technology solutions, um, it wouldn't be unusual to spend $1,250 a lead. And and taking a step back from that, um, now, you know, if you talk to a C-level executive who really should be tuned into what's going on on this data stuff, but if you talk to a C-level executive, if you start talking about databases and leads, they gloss over so quickly, you lose them just like that. You know, they're, they're gone. They're just not that interested in it, but they should be. And they should be interested in how much should a lead cost. That's one, been one of the popular blogs over the last 20 years, honestly. How much should a lead cost and what percentage of lead sales close are the two most popular blogs. They just have no idea. So what happens with is the sales says, I need more leads and I need better quality leads. Marketing says, I never get any feedback from sales on what I'm giving them. And the next quarter, the, the senior executives basically cut the marketing budget and ask for more leads. <laughs> and that seems to happen over and over and over again. And what you got to do is you got to have these senior executives understand exactly what are the components of lead costs and why that's so important to the entire process. So you're not wasting the time and money of your salespeople sending them after poor quality leads. Well, as you say that, it, it you know, I think it would be <laughs> helpful for you to share a story that you actually I had talked about, which is the $100,000 wasted uh, from a lead generation decision. If you could share a little bit about this particular story. That is, a, that is an absolutely fascinating story. And I can remember it like it was yesterday. I was sitting in the room with the CEO of the company, the senior salesperson and the senior marketing person. And my client actually was the senior marketing person. And they were so upset and so angry about what was going on as they said, look, I don't care we will do exactly what you want us to do. We're going to spend a hundred thousand dollars and we can either give you some high quality face-to-face -face appointments with the right decision maker and the right sort of size company with the right vertical, with the right need. But those are going to cost you. We may only get a couple of hundred of those. Uh, or on the other end of the spectrum, we can go up to one of these big data sources and basically say, we want this size company and these verticals and this geography or whatever the criteria was. And we'll just give those to you. We can get you 20,000 of those. And it was kind of a midpoint, which was like, you know, I, I get maybe 5,000 leads, so-called leads, 
but you know, uh, I'm not, so I'm not going with the the twenty thousand, but but I'm not, I'm certainly not going to be satisfied with the two hundred. And unfortunately, they went with that. And the marketing guy said, "Look, I'm giving them exactly what they want. They 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 I gave them all the options, and they told me exactly what they wanted, and I'm giving them exactly what they wanted." And the CEO said, "But yeah, but they're not generating any business." Say. So, that's not my job. My job is to give them, give them the leads that they're looking for. So, so and that really happened. I mean, it was a live conversation. I'm still in touch with the guys that, that were part of that process. Okay. So as you're talking that, I think, and sharing that, I think that's where a lot of organizations are starting to do something in regards to alignment, sales and marketing alignment. They're looking at, you know, you know, changing and getting rid of certain roles and then now instituting, you know, chief revenue officers or chief growth officers, or, you know, they're looking across the entire spectrum of the organization and looking for different, you know, uh, revenue streams and, uh, and all kinds of different things. But how do you see that fixing the problem that you just kind of discussed? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned alignment and, um, Account-based marketing, I think, is it could be the answer to that question. But if you think about it, if you go back to 1993, Peppers and Rogers was the earliest company to talk about alignment between sales and marketing and account-based marketing. And then in the early 2000s, ITSMA actually basically invented the uh, account-based marketing, and they had a whole process for it. And then somehow, you know, John Miller in the mid 2010s. Um, you know, invented um, Marketo and then eventually a, a pure account-based marketing company. And um, it, it, it it's not going to fix it, but I mean, one of the things that I talk about all the time is putting sort of a um, judicial branch in between marketing and sales so that basically if a lead has been defined and sales and marketing agree on that lead definition, then if a lead gets turned over for sales and sales says it's not qualified, it goes through a judicial branch instead of just basically being ignored. Um, and if basically sales doesn't accept the lead for some reason, then the judicial branch looks into that. And, and you, it wouldn't have to, it wouldn't last very long. It might only last three to four months before the, the organization would get a sense for, you know, the CEO of this company really cares about the quality of the leads. And we're really going to look into every one of these and make sure that we, nail down this process so that we do understand what should a lead cost, what percentage a lead should close, all of these details. And I think that would solve the problem. Um, it, it, I've actually seen companies and I've worked with companies and helped companies accomplish that. And it's magical what can happen. Well, okay. So as you're talking about that, I, I'm trying to understand where the uh, differentiation comes in from it being a peer process. Uh, to it being a particular product and a technology, because everybody starts talking about, hey, my marketing stack, you know, MarTech, sale, you know, sales stack. I mean, all of those types of, you know, technologies in order to help them to be more hopefully efficient and effective. So how does how does technology and the execution fit in that? Well, um, and you know, there's over 10,000 sales and marketing technology solutions out there right now. I think it's well over 10,000 now. And, you know, I'm famous for saying that, you know, sales and marketing technology has made it possible to get more poor quality leads to sales faster than ever before. Um, but what I'm, what I'm talking about, and I'll give you a specific example. I'm working with a client right now. They have a database of four or 500 people that have reached out to them and asked for their, um, information about their services happens to be an engineering company and the reality is we've done the market analysis there are only 183 total contacts in their market that are worth talking to they, they, they have a big enough business and there's enough business for this engineering company to hit an, a minimum size order that makes sense for them now and historically what they've done is quarter after quarter they mail out a, a newsletter or an annual christmas card to everybody on the list without regard to whether any of them are qualified or not but if we, you know, laser like precision on 183 total contacts in this marketplace and we spend all of our money making sure that they know us and they know how we're different and, you know, why they should do work with us. And we, we, we do much different marketing tactics for this company than anybody else has ever thought of. And it's a way for us to develop one on one relationships with one to one as opposed to one to many or one to a few of the many. 
I, you know, what you said right there, I think, is uh, something that a lot of people have and and struggle with in regards to uh, the 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 platform, the venue, um, the market size, the market um, opportunity, uh, how how to go about. Uh, and, you know, actually, and, you know, doing the whole engaging and nurturing process. And so therefore, when we start thinking about product market fit and all of these things that go along with it, a lot of times we look at our, we don't uh, apply that to our sales and marketing strategies, strategies and methodologies. And so there's a lot of big time mismatch. So in other words, like you started talking about that, you know, you know smaller addressable market, doing certain things to them is going to push them away faster than pull them in. Um, if I start looking at, you know, push button tactics, you know, and being able to send things at mass, that's going to push away better, more smooth than a track. Right. How many times do you see that whole fit thing being a problem? But most of the time, um, unfortunately it's, um, and it's so easy to push that button and not, you know, not pick up the phone afterwards and make a call and try to make, you know, face face to face or even just telephone contact with the prospects. As a matter of fact, um, I can't tell you how many times I've heard from senior executives that they they got a call and they might have gotten an email and a call, but a lot of times it's just a call. And it was something that they actually that piqued their interest. They were they're sort of interested in it. But they said, you know what, I'm really busy this week and I know they'll call back. You know, so I'm I'll hear from them again and you know, I'll just talk to them that time. Well you know what? I guess what? If nobody's persistent enough to call back the second, third, fourth, fifth time. They're a little bit afraid that they're going to, you know, damage any kind of potential relationship. So they're light touch instead of heavy touch. In fact, I've got a really quick story I can tell you that years ago, the CFO at the top 50 utilities in the country were prospects for my com- my client. It was a it was a firm that global firm that did um, all sorts of consulting and back office and front office solutions. And on the 43rd call, the CFO of the fourth largest utility in the co- company or country called and said, don't stop calling me. You're my conscience. I've been wanting to talk to you. I've just been extremely busy. Five months later, that closed for a billion dollar deal. Somebody said, well, 43 touches. That was way too many. I said, well, actually, it was just enough. <laughs> it was the right number. And that's that's the thing is, is that, you know, companies don't they're not persistent enough and they don't. Um, do layered contact and what I call multi-touch, multimedia, multi-cycle processes to multiply results. Um, those are all things that go into this equation. And I, I'm really not asking the CEO to get into the nuts and bolts of this. I'm asking them to agree at a high level on how much a lead should cost and what percentage of lead should sales close and what's the proper way of handling a lead as it goes through your company. How do we develop the lead? And then monitor that, you know, so that it's not just up to the sales and marketing people just to get together and have a kumbaya meeting. And, and then they go right back to doing what they were doing before. Well, as you say that, Dan, I, I, I start worrying that yeah. people could potentially interpret and say that we need a cadence that's 43 touches long because Dan yeah. McDade said so. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, and then therefore that goes back to the whole thing about push button prospect experience, right? It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. So, I mean, how do we find the balance and find the humanity? So, again, to me, prospect experience, and, and I heard some people say, really doing business is H to H. It's human to human. I'm like, oh, okay, that's fine. But from a you know theoretical perspective and from a vision perspective, that's fantastic. But how do you execute upon that knowing that I, what, I, I may have to build a 43-step cadence? I, I can't do that. Yeah. Well, I understand it's, 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 well, the right number, the right number of touches is eminently testable. Um, so it, we, we didn't start out by saying we're going to invest 43 touches. We started out by saying, here's our, our touch plan. And back in those days, it was called multi-touch multimedia. And now it's called cadence or, or, you know, one of the other names out there. But, um, and unfortunately, it, unfortunately, what that really means is it really means how many electronic touches are we going to make? Because they're not making phone calls. They're not trying to actually pick up the phone and talk to people. They're just sending out all the emails that they can and, you know, basically doing Google ads and whatnot. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it could be as few as seven and it could be as many as a hundred. We had one company for another client that we worked with for 10 years and they credited us for 
a de- generating 45% compound annual growth rate every year for about the first five years we worked with them. And we had one prospect that it took three years to get them to go from n- no response to not interested to call me back in six months to eventually becoming a hundred thousand dollar a month client. And if we hadn't stayed on top of them over that three year period, we wouldn't have gotten that business. And it was very cost effective. We, we didn't invest that many touches, but we invested probably a few touches every quarter over three years. And that turned into a huge deal for our client and it made a hell of a commission for, for one of their salespeople. And definitely. Okay. So then help us from your perspective, get a little bit of cl- clarity. Uh, what is prospect experience? Yeah, the, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the prospect experience right now for the market, I use myself and I think you probably agree for yourself, is, is the prospect experience is very poor. Um, and a lot of times it's because people don't really understand that, you know, generating a prospect is how you get customers. <laughs> you know, it's not all about the customer experience until they become a customer, but generating a prospect to become a customer is critically important. So that whole process has to be fixed and it's the, it's just a matter of saying um uh, if i talk about the market the message and the metrics so have we identified the right market or do we have the ideal customer profile right are we just identifying the right market that doesn't have to be all of the market to start with they can be a subset of the market um and what is the message that we're using to take to that market and, and again that market and that message is testable and the metrics, you know, including the cadence is testable. So I think that's the answer is, is that it is, you're right. It's not about, I'm going to make 43 touches because Dan McDade's, McDade said, that's what I got to do. You're going to make um, anywhere from five or six touches to 50 touches over a period of time. And then you're going to determine which one is cost effective. Okay. All right. So then if I'm looking at, <clears throat> this attraction component uh, versus the nurturing component. Help me understand how that particular transaction takes place. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm really glad you circled back around to that because the nurturing piece of this is just unbelievably important. And it's the nurturing is maybe the thing that has the most impacts for companies. And it's very few companies are actually doing it right. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, and hopefully um, I'll be able to paint a picture here um, that makes sense. But, you know, if you take a look at a market as being a thousand prospects and you do something against those thousand prospects and you get just to make the math easy, we're going to see you get you get a five percent lead rate that turns into 50 leads. OK, if you if you take that same market of a thousand and you break it down into groups of 200, so you've got five groups of 200. And they're sort of intuitively ranked. So we think that, you know, this size company and this vertical and this geography, they have a better chance of doing, you know, what the, the bottom, what the bottom quartile is, so to speak. Um, so that segmentation will give you a lot of answers. And, and what happens is that you could spend, you can generate over 80% of the response with 60% of the spend. If you, as you go down the list to, you know, what you consider intuitively the best prospects to intuitively the worst prospects, that list will reorder itself over and over again. And that's how you go out and that's how you acquire the clients cost effectively. You know, you know, it's not a matter of just spending more money. It's a matter of cost effectively identifying the right prospects. Um, now, switching over, switching gears, nurturing makes it possible to generate three times the opportunity from the same spend. So if you generated 50 leads, the first time you went through this list, if you properly nurture that same list, you're going to generate 153 leads over a period of time. And it's not going to cost you a whole lot extra because you're only reaching out to those companies that make the most sense. Okay. So if I start looking at one of the things that you talk often about, you, you refer to a revenue focused marketing process. Uh, so help us understand what is a revenue focused marketing process versus some other type of focus process. And I, you know, I see so much press on this and what it really gets down to is it gets down to, or is what you're doing to generate revenue or is it to generate a brand? And I argue that, you know, Coca-Cola has enough money to generate a brand. Um, prospect experience doesn't, you know, most companies don't. So the revenue focused piece of this is to say, you know, we, we're, our marketing activity are going to be focused on generating revenue. 
if it will generate some brand, and especially if we're talking to the right people at the, with the right cadence, it will generate some brand. But we're really interested in generating revenue. And the reason I came up with revenue-focused marketing, because I used to talk, as I have already here today, I used to talk a lot about account-based marketing. Um, I, I talk about revenue-focused marketing because I think account-based marketing has got so watered down and is so misunderstood. Basically, people are like up to here, like, oh, account-based marketing, we've tried that, that doesn't work. So um, I was trying for, you know, trying for something different with revenue-focused marketing. But I really do believe strongly in account-based marketing. And I think account-based marketing at its core, according to John Miller, account-based marketing is really revenue-focused marketing. It's not brand building. Oh, I think that is a very important distinction because when, even when you start talking about at the very top of organizations that may not be so connected to their to their customers and their prospects and everything, right? Hey, I'm 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 way up here up top. I set vision, right? Is they are always thinking about the egotistical element of I got to build brand. I got to build brand awareness. I've got to, you know, I, people need to know us, all of those types of things. But you're saying, well, well wait a minute. Um, if you take that particular approach, you're not going to generate as much revenue. Um, so if I think about my focus and my vision setting, is it like an 80-20 scenario? 80% of my marketing should be around uh, the revenue generation, um, you know, type of marketing. And then whatever the 20% is kind of like that brand building and brand recognition piece, or is there some type of different breakdown? Yeah, but I think it's probably not too far off. I'll give you one good example is, is that, you know, SAP, I think still has an annual conference called Sapphire. And there were companies that basically came away from that conference with nothing. They didn't get any leads. They really didn't get anything. But, but if they had not been there, people would say, well, gee, I wonder what happened to XYZ company. They weren't at Sapphire this year. They not, must not be around anymore or whatever. So there has to be some spend there. But uh, another example, this is a company that um, I have done some work for. I'm not doing work with them currently, but it's a basically it's a, um, a healthcare oriented company. And the CEO of that company said, I want our company name to be known by every prospect in this market. I want everybody to know us. Okay. To be honest with you, that's a stupid thing to do because there aren't but a couple hundred companies that actually could buy their services from them. So why would you want 10,000 companies to know all about you when it's only 200 you can sell to? I mean, it doesn't make any sense at all. So in that particular case, sure, there might be a trade show or two that they have to go to, you know, to, to be visible. Um, and, and maybe they get some, you know, some content, some, some stuff that they can, um, reuse out of those. But, uh, it, it's a good example of how not to go about spending somebody's money, which by the way, this is a huge venture backed deal. Um, and you wonder every day, how can these guys be watching this company do this and not do something about it? <laughs> well, I, yeah, it makes, it does make you wonder. Uh, and so for me, th that's what we find most often is, and I call it corporate arrogance. You know, you can, you can call it whatever you want, but that's not prospect experience focused. Right. You know, same thing happens when we start talking about, you know, customer retention and, and all of the things that are associated with, okay, now I have gone through, you know, the attraction and the nurturing process and the sales process and now they're customers. Oh, then, Hey, by the way, the service that I'm going to provide you, it's going to suck and you're going to leave. Wait a yeah. minute. Right? <laughs> so it's like, so we, we have to look and be able to separate, you know, what we want uh, and give our prospects what they want. Same thing with our customers. If we if we want to have some true continued front side and backside growth, meaning that I'm retaining more customers and I'm I'm attracting more customers, if the experience is not present throughout, we're just like everyone else. Yeah, and, and to your point, I think that the prospect experience is turning people off, and they never do convert to clients. And when you read every place you go, that you know, it's it's a lot less expensive to generate business from a current client than it is a new prospect. I only think that goes so far. You know, I think that the, you, you you can you can overplay that, but um, the, but I, I do believe it. Um, uh, but but I think that, that if you don't fix that prospect experience, and that's where the C level executives don't seem to get it. If you don't fix that prospect experience, you're going to generate fewer clients, and you're going to put more pressure on current clients to generate revenue than you are going out and actually doing a good job of prospecting in your marketplace. I mean, that, that's a great point. So, I mean, if, 
from a statistic perspective, um, you know, the, the long longevity of an organization, I think you buy yourself some time uh, when you're more effective at the retention piece. So I'm not churning and burning customers, yeah. right? Okay. However, if you look at all the studies around, you know, a company's growth, it's about new acquisition. So you have people on both sides of the camp and then everybody starts, you know, infighting saying, no, we need to focus more on retention. No, <laughs> look, just focus on experience all throughout. And then you're going to pick up both sides. You're going to get the retention element uh, and then you're going to get the attra attraction element. And then therefore that you may start experiencing some, some hockey stick growth as far as that's concerned. So then it's, hey, get ready to service more customers, right? Well, and also to your point, just to tag on just a little bit, this is that um, companies spend so much time talking about now that, you know, the consumer is so used to the Amazon experience that you have to provide the Amazon experience in everything you do. That's really not true. I mean, you can't provide the Amazon experience in certain situations and it's not cost effective to do so. So, and, and that's the biggest problem I have, I call it with the great unwashed or the zeitgeist, who, by the way, are filling up artificial intelligence with the wrong answers most of the time. <laughs> but by definition, you know, they're, what AI is looking for is it's looking for what does the mass believe, you know, which basically is not necessarily always right. But, um, you know, you can't expect the, um, I, I could go. I could go on here for about thirty minutes, but you know, there's three conditions of need, three reasons why people buy anything for anybody, whether it's for themselves or for the company. And you don't worry about providing an Amazon-like experience on an app when you're at the point where you're talking to somebody about their ERP solution. You know, um, it's just a different way of approaching it. And and you know, so I think putting the focus on like putting the focus on a, a lead cost one hundred eighty-three dollars. That's going to totally screw up companies if a lead actually costs twelve hundred and fifty dollars, and they have to have conversations about that and agree on that. Otherwise, they're not going to get the problem fixed. You know, you bring up an interesting point. I, I mean, that I, in a lot of different uh, iterations of working with different clients, uh, we start talking about the actual total cost and total impact. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, people try to do the same thing in regards to employee turnover. You know, what is yeah. the cost of employee turnover or what is the cost of employee turnover and people are just looking at well it costs this in order to you know market the opening it costs this to go through the interview process uh, and that's where they stop and i'm like okay wait a minute okay so so what about you know the lost capacity what about the overtime that you've had to provide because now you're short staffed what about you know, I mean, all of these types of other impacts to the business that people just don't necessarily see uh, that are really driving those replacement costs and those turnover costs uh, significantly higher than they could have ever imagined. It's like, fix that problem because you're hemorrhaging. Yeah. In fact, I'll tell you a quick story here that you'll like because it's sort of the other side of what you're talking about, that there was a company that's a huge direct response company in North America. And they made the decision that they, and this has been a few years ago, but they made the decision that they were going to have an inside sales department to kind of supplement the field sales department. And they decided that they were going to make it a revolution. They were going to go out and tell everybody what they were doing. And we said, wait, 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 let's make this more of an evolution. So we did a customer satisfaction analysis before they made any changes. They made some changes, which I'll tell you about in just a minute. And then we did a customer satisfaction analysis at the end. And what happened was, is that instead of sales reps making a trip per month to the clients, the sales reps, the physical sales reps, the field sales reps were making three trips a year, but they were supplementing on the other end with like a dozen phone calls. And at the end of the year, the customer satisfaction was up and he asked them why. And they said, because we saw more of our sales rep this year. <laughs> and they actually saw, they actually saw them one third or one quarter of the time that they did previously. So anyway, it's the same, same story as what you're just telling, just the opposite side of it, which is, you know, don't, don't create a, a revolution, make an evolution and test as you go. And then you can determine exactly what you should do. Uh, and that's a really great point. Uh, and, and we also have to, you know, understand that you know, we are conditioned in certain ways uh, and we expect that to happen in the future. I mean, they're yeah. bias, right? We expect that to pet that pattern to repeat. So I think you using the, the word of evolution is probably, you know, significantly more pro appropriate than saying transformation. Right. Right. I agree with that. 
So sometimes we have to chunk down, you know, that relationship, you know, building component. We would, you know, we would like to get to the point to where everybody loves us and knows us, but that's a stepping stone across a very extensive and wide creek, you know, where we would love to just throw people over and say, hey, you know us and love us, let's do business. But that's not the way it works. So when you start, you know, talking about and you were referring to it earlier, you know, that three years down the road, that, all those types of things. What are you seeing in regards to right now that actual, you know, customer journey and customer buying process? How has it changed in the past couple of years? Well, you know, the natural answer to that question is, is that, you know, so many um, individuals are doing a lot of research and they're, you know, they're 70% through the buying process before a sales rep even needs to get involved. I don't agree with that. Um, the ITSMA doesn't agree with that. Um, and I'll, and I'll tell you what I do find is really helpful. No matter what sales solution you're using or sales methodology that you're using, there are really five steps in the sales process. And you can, anybody who takes their current system or their current situation and puts it through this process, they'll be surprised what they find out. But, you know, one is to find a pain or need. Two, get agreement that they have a pain or need. Three, get agreement to, to do something about the pain or need. Fourth, most importantly, agree to a generic solution. And then fifth, agree to a customized specific solution or, or our solution, if it's appropriate to sell our solution. Most companies, their marketing department stops and starts on number one, and the sales department starts and stops on number five. And all those very important steps, two through four, totally get skipped. So one, one of the things that you can do is you can just basically kind of remap where we are with each of these prospects. Or, or customers, if we're trying to expand the customer relationship along the lines of where are they from the sales buying standpoint? And that's the other thing companies get hung up on saying is really the buying process. It's not the sales process. Well, it's both. You know, there's still a sales process and there's still a buying process. They have to be linked, but I wouldn't say, Oh, well, the, you know, the sales reps don't have to worry about it until they get the call because the client's going to call them. You know, after they do 70% of the research to be 70% along the way, that that's a mistake. That's a huge mistake. You want to get in early in any deal, no matter what. And, and that's a critically important factor. Well, I, yeah, I mean, you bring up a really important point because what I see most organizations putting 90% or more of their effort in uh, is essentially that very last stage within the yep. decision-making process where, a company is already probably chosen who they're going to go with, and they're just looking for some type of benchmark to compare them with. Yeah, column fodder is what I call it. But yeah, say that one more time. Column fodder. Column fodder. I like yeah. that. Um, and so they're putting a whole lot of spend within that last thing because, you know, hey, they're 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 quick to make a decision. Uh, they already know what type of solution they need. But I'm like, man, that that's a bloody red ocean. Uh, if that's where you're putting most of your efforts and spend, I, to me, I would want to be part of the massive group that's well far in front of that, uh, that hasn't actually realized that they can have a, a problem. Yeah. As opposed to competing against an incumbent vendor or somebody that's already been selected, you know, you want to basically define and control the, the process. And it's possible to do that if you get in, as you say, you know, suggesting you get in early as you can, but. Um, it's certainly harder to do it if you if you're getting in if the client is already at step five, um, then you got to figure out a way of you know changing the changing the rules, changing the game. Well, for me, I'd almost want to put them into okay. Uh, I know there's going to possibly be a, an issue with the onboarding process, um, whoever they selected. I know that you know there's going to be you know certain things within the time frame of that implementation process. Um, and then, so I would start thinking about that perspective is like, okay, let's get them to switch at these key points in time when we know switching does occur. Yeah. And I think, you know, another one you probably like is uh, change management. How many companies go about in putting a solution together and getting it implemented, and they but they haven't done any change management and the organization goes crazy because they're just not, you know, they're not bought in and they don't understand and that kind of thing. It's just, you know, over and over again. That's a good one to ask when they're far, so far along. You know, I haven't, I haven't heard you talk about change management. How are you addressing that in the organization? Oh, they're, they're not having you address that. I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, you're, so I think your adoption rate is going to be a little problematic. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> that goes back into the whole retention piece. Yeah, uh, yeah. 
So the experience, again, has to be all the way through. So prospect experience, if you were to start thinking about that differentiating element, right? I have competitors of all different types and sizes, which includes that whole Amazon experience thinking. I mean, I've got competitors from all over the place coming at me from the, you know left, right, you know, forward and back. But if I start thinking about prospect experience and the differentiation that it could actually provide to an organization, you've kind of hit this in a couple of times, but if you can wrap it up, what is a prospect experience mindset, customer uh, prospect experience execution? What does it potentially mean for me? You know, I think it's um, meeting the customer where they are um, and being as a guy in the industry that uses this a lot, but um, being empathetic, I think is critically important. And that, you know, um, and uh, this is cliche, and it's, it's it's maybe one of the more difficult areas to, um, to 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 do. But you know, and that is these insights that people talk about creating insights. I read an article today by one of these huge, you know, um, company. I don't want to say who they are, but one of these huge companies that does a lot of work in data, and they were talking about. Um, the creation of communication with prospects. And really it came down to insights. How do you develop insights? How do you, um, how can you do uh, personalization at scale, which is like one of my least favorite things to say. But um, I think that, um, I think it comes down to you, you have the right person with the right information in front of the right prospect at the right time. And companies lose sight of that. You know, and they'll have one size fits all for their content. And, um, you know, they, 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 they don't really talk to different customer segments differently. Um, you know, for example, this company that I was telling you about that's an engineering company with 183 accounts. Actually, it's 183 contacts. Um, you know, the ones that are the biggest where, you know, there's a huge opportunity, but the larger the opportunity, typically the longer the sales cycle. You know, they have to be treated a lot differently than the relatively small ma and pa type organization. That sounds simplistic, but it's something that they do. They're they're mailing the same quarterly newsletter out to all of them, right. and that's not going to get it. Definitely not. As an old mentor said to said to me, and I've, I've repeated it a couple times on different episodes, is nobody wants your frickin' newsletter. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with that one. <laughs> Another one of those cadence touches we need to get rid of. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Dan McDade, fantastic conversation. Uh, I think prospect experience is now hopefully going to be something that listeners and watchers are going to think quite differently on and hopefully change their tactics and their processes and kind of, you know, look at that whole revenue generation marketing more so than they ever have before. Dan, how does the B2B DM gang get in touch with you? Probably the easiest way is to go to my website, which is prospect-experience.com, or I can be reached at dan.mcdade at prospect-experience.com, or pick up the phone and call me at 770-262-9021. Dan, thank you for your sharing your knowledge and wisdom, and we wish you the very best. I enjoyed it. Thanks so much. Thank you for joining us. Go now to join the B2B DM gang in the B2B Marketer LinkedIn group, where you can connect with other B2B DM disruptors and get access to our B2B DM cheat sheets, checklist, and guides. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, please help by going to iTunes to rate, review, and subscribe. And share the show on all of your digital platforms. Be sure to tune in next week for our next episode. And always remember, you can automate your lead capture, but you must lure your lead.